I offer these every week along with a guided meditation. Just click the uh, subscribe link below to be notified through YouTube when I post the latest recording. Or if you'd like to join us live, which would be great, uh, just go into the description section below and follow the link along to be able to sign up for free. I've been talking about the broad theme of how to live together. And last week we explored what we can learn from the early infant caregiver relationship uh, with its three fundamental qualities uh, that are so critical for each of us growing up of emotional availability of our caregivers, empathic attunement, and skillful responsiveness. And we can imagine and practice with how we ourselves have been affected as little kids by the ups and downs of how our caregivers were with us. And today, we can look at our relationships with others through this lens of the cradle of our adult relationships, notably emotional availability, empathic attunement, and skillful responsiveness, and use that as a way of looking at ourselves and also looking at other people. So that's what I explored last week, and if that topic interests you, you can go back to the recording for it. I'd like to continue with this exploration of how to live together, and I'm right now focusing on some of the fundamentals with my talk tonight that I title One and Two, Joining and Separating in Our Relationships. And this is a major theme joining separation, intimacy, autonomy, love, power uh, in psychology. It's also a major theme in Buddhist practice. For example, on the one hand, we have this teaching from the Sutta Nipata that goes like this, quote, as I am, so are others. As others are, so am I. Having thus identified self and others, harm no one or have them harmed. This is also completely parallel to the teaching from Africa that I'm learning more and more about, um, Ubuntu, essentially translated as, um, as you are, I am. And this is a teaching really of interdependence and oneness on the one hand. On the other hand, we have the Buddha's last words, as we've been told, translated by Stephen Batchelor, great teacher, in this way. Things fall apart, tread the path with care. Each of us has our own path. It, we may share it with others. It may have shared features with others. But much as we are the inheritors of the results, the karmas, of our intentional actions, uh, in, in, in much as in that way, we are also the inheritors of our efforts to tread our own path with care. It's our path, and it's up to us to tread it. There's a deep theme of individual responsibility. Individual responsibility, personal responsibility, doesn't mean anything unless there are individuals who can be responsible. So we have these two truths, these two truths of joining and separating, of interdependence and personal responsibility. These, these are deep, 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 deep themes in Buddhist practice. In everyday life, there's a developmental trajectory, much as I began to talk about last week, in which as very, very little children, we came into the world with an enormous sense of dependence on our caregivers with very, very fuzzy boundaries. You know, in utero, inside the womb, like where do, where do I end and where does this gushy stuff begin, right? Um, we may not have you know, clear memories of what it was like to be inside the womb, but the amygdala, one of the you know, key elements of uh, you know, responding emotionally to our situations is anatomically mature by roughly the seventh month or so in utero. And so we're capable of starting to acquire uh, memories of different kinds, somatic memories, including loaded maybe a little heavily on 
anxiety or fear. So whether we remember inside the womb or not, or remember the earliest days of our life, you know, as we come out, it's it's kind of fuzzy. Like, <laughs> where are the boundaries here? What are the differentiation? But after a while, it starts to become kind of clear that, oh, there's this happening kind of here and there's that other thing, you know, the breast perhaps, that I'm that I'm latching on to. And, and when it goes away, ah, it's not here anymore. Wait, I thought it was a part of me. It's gone. Wait. And there's this gradual developing, useful, normal understanding of self and world, self and other. There's deep dependence on caregivers, but there's a growing sense of this body, this collection of perceptions. And developmentally, I have a background in developmental psychology, there's some major milestones along the way, such as by nine months, just nine months, little infant, hardly support itself in sitting up, maybe getting ready, you know, able to do it, beginning to do that, um, that infant is starting to realize that in the mind of others, they're having their own thoughts. And they may not be my thoughts. Their focus of attention, for example, may not be my focus of attention. And so you'll start to find it around nine months old, infants developing what's called intersubjectivity and beginning to do things deliberately to get the caregiver's attention. You know, they'll do experiments. So they'll have a, let's say, a, an infant of nine months and let's say the mother sitting across from each other. And they'll ask the mother deliberately to look away and the infant will start doing things to get the mother to look back, or they'll do something and give the infant something fun and interesting to look at, like a cool you know, rattle of some kind. And you'll see the infant doing things to get the mother to look at it. And you know, based on the mother's you know, eye gaze, uh, the infant will start to infer whether she's actually sharing attention, sharing states of mind, or having divergent states of mind with the infant. Uh, infants being able to move away, very important, move away from the food that the caregivers are starting to shove in their mouth. That's differentiation. I have one of my earlier memories, I think I'm probably four maybe, I don't know. I have memories before that as well. I'm sitting in a high chair in my family's home in North Dakota. It's in the family. My dad grew up on a ranch there. And I'm sitting in a high chair. And my uh, father's older sister, uh, no longer with us, uh, is very determined to shove some food in my mouth. I kind of think it was mashed potatoes. And I didn't want any. You know, but her spoon kept following me around. And she was going to make sure the potatoes landed. And I finally had to surrender and open up the hangar, you know, for the plane to arrive. Right? So right there, we have very young children in very simple ways, pre-verbally, although I was verbal by then, um, be able to uh, differentiate what they want from you know, the wants of others. So there's this normal process of differentiation and also signaling from me, the individual, to you, you know, the father, let's say, that I need something. Wow. <laughs> I'm uncomfortable, I need my diaper changed, or wah, I'm hungry, or wah, I'm bored, or wah, I'm lonely, to you know, get a result from the world. Uh, so we're both acting upon the world, independence upon it, and we're the actors. So you can see these two themes wonderfully weaving together. And as I talk here about these various themes, and some of them informed by developmental psychology and the science there, I really encourage you to kind of bring it down out of the clouds of ideas and bring it down to your direct experience. Oh, how is this real for me? For example, in relationships, there is um, a movement typically toward distancing or closeness. Now, both of these are important. We need to be able to do both. We need to be able appropriately to move into closeness when it's safe and rewarding and it feels right to us. We need to be able to distance when we have to get away from something or on our own, maybe in solitude or just independently. We need to pursue our own goals autonomously. We need both of these. What's, what's healthy is balance, but people can tilt in one direction more than in the other. 
For example, you can see in relationships a classic dynamic of pursuer-distancer. We have the person whose form of optimal distance, you know, stretches out pretty far. And then we have the other person who'd like to be closer. You can see this sometimes in conversation. You can see people who, whose sense of physical distance with others is pretty close. They keep moving in while the other person, you know, keeps edging away. Uh, or you can see people who try to find some kind of compromise in which they're seemingly connecting, but actually they're also distancing in a way that's comfortable, kind of like if I could show you, you know, reaching out the hand to shake it while leaning back at the same time. Or connecting through bickering, uh, through quarreling about one thing or another, uh, or connecting through intellectualizing, in which there's a combination of both, um, you know, communicating with another person, being related to them, while also keeping them somehow at arm's length. And you can observe dynamics in relationships in which uh, a person who'd like more intimacy and more closeness feels like the best they can do is sort of hover around the edges or the force field, hover around the force field of the other person who is quite content for the person who wants more closeness to kind of orbit them. You know, they like having them around, but eh, do not want them to come in for a landing. You see the tensions in this, right? You could see it in your own um, movement in relationships, moment to moment. Are you moving toward or away? Is that other person moving toward or away? Toward as in joining, away as in separating. And that natural process is perfectly fine as long as we're conscious of it and it serves us and other people. On the other hand, there are many people, and I certainly have been among them, and I'm still a work in progress, in which they get kind of stuck in one pole of joining or separating. And a lot of that stuckness has to do with early experiences. When our caregivers growing up um, and then later on, versions of this with our peer groups or other, other kids, uh, including our siblings, if there are uh, really effective forms, appropriate, reasonably good enough forms for the particular individual, and some individuals are simply more, more sensitive or dependent or introverted and distant by nature, so depending on the individual, but if, if we grow up in a way in which there's appropriate emotional availability, empathic attunement, and skillful responsiveness, then what happens is we internalize healthy caregiving from others. We build up what in developmental psychology and attachment theory is called an internalized secure base from which we can then launch autonomously and independently. Also in healthy families, um, you know, healthy forms of self-expression of young children, even if they need to be re regulated a little bit or on the edges, are not squashed or punished or shamed. Uh, so there's room to breathe independently. You know, you, you learn how to be independent, and um, it's okay to, to be that way, to be your full self out loud. So then we grow up in these healthy environments with a comfort at both closeness and individuation, differentiation, being your own person. That happens in really healthy, happy families, which my wife grew up in one and makes it harder for her to understand my neurotic tendencies, as I've said. On the other hand, if like me, you grew up in a you know less than perfect environment for all kinds of reasons, including some that originated in me, uh, not abusive, but you know, imperfect, uh, you can get kind of stuck in one pole or another. On the one hand, a person can become kind of stuck in clingy, anxious, insecure forms of attachment, you know, in which there's a real priority on joining and a kind of panickiness that can happen or an anticipatory anxiety that there will be separation, either through others going away and abandoning you or casting you out. Oh, very scary. 
On the other hand, this is more my style, you can get kind of stuck in avoidance, avoidant forms of insecure attachment, in which there's an intense focus on boundaries and walls around you and defenses and prickly independence um, and a certain discomfort with the joining, with the, imp with the intimacy that could feel like a threat to independence. You know, I grew up in an environment in which one of the dynamics in it is that on the heels of being drawn into re relationship with my mother, who was an extremely loving and wonderful person, uh, on the heels of that, I would kind of lower my defenses and then somehow really quickly with some would come some form of unwanted judgment uh, or advice or control. So unfortunately, I learned as a kid to not enter into that form of joining, which was, of course, a sorrow for my mother and prevented me from receiving some important social supplies that I had to acquire later on in adulthood and happily kind of retroactively internalizing myself. So you can see these very normal range, normal range issues, and you can imagine then extremes of them, extremes of um, enmeshment, blurred boundaries, uh, in, you know, controlling dependence on the one extreme, or you can imagine people who are hyper-independent, hyper-detached, uh, perhaps through intellectualizing or going into their head or really numbing out and keeping other people um, very, very, very much at arm's length. So these are real themes and they create a lot, a lot of suffering. And uh, without any kind of critique of uh, Buddhist teachings, you don't tend, you know, modern psychology offers some useful uh, insights and clarities and practices actually that can inform and enhance, not replace, but inform and enhance traditional contemplative practices, including in the Buddhist tradition that I'm centered in with enormous gratitude for that tradition. So another version of this polarization to some extent of joining and separating uh, is this, whether it's gender socialization or just because I read too much science fiction as a kid or I, you know, my father's a scientist, no longer with us, whatever reason, I tended um, in my relationships, including through the point that we had young children, to deal with situations from the standpoint of detached quote unquote, objective analysis and problem solving. And I got rewarded for that. Uh, it seemed like a way to be. <laughs> My gender-based models uh, looked like that, kind of seemed like how I ought to be. And then, you know, uh, some years into our marriage, uh, my, we had children and suddenly it became crystal clear that what was really necessary instead was to start by joining. Then maybe there'd be a place later on for a more objective, detached, 20,000 foot view, Spock-like way of talking about things and approaching things. But if I started by joining, empathy, slowing down, asking questions, not coming in immediately with my infinite wisdom, not offering unwanted advice that contains the implicit message that I'm superior somehow and no better, I'm the knower, I'm the advisor. <laughs> not doing that. And instead, starting by joining, then if eventually, um, you know, my wife would say yes, if I eventually might ask her the question, so do you do you want my take on this or kind of thought about what might help here? And then it was there was much more openness to it. It went a lot better. You could think also, and here's a personal story uh, about workplace environments. You know, I, I remember the very first meeting I was on, on the first board of directors I was on for a community um, family 
Center, offering psychotherapy and other resources for various families. So I came to this meeting, and perhaps not coincidentally, I was the only man present, and uh, there were about, you know, 10 people on the board. I walked into the meeting, I'd read the agenda, I'd read all the reports, I'd really studied the financials, you know, I was ready, I'd done my homework, right? I was ready to be helpful. And I walked in and everybody's just hanging out in the kitchen. I'm like, uh, are we meeting? And so we just hung out in the kitchen for 15, 20 minutes, yakking away, introducing each other, eating some food, chilling out. Finally, the chair of the board says, oh, we, we might as well get started. So we finally sit down, you know, half an hour late. And I'm thinking, man, this is so, what a mess. You know, I also had a business background coming into it. And then, kaboom, we get into the meat of the meeting, totally flows. Wow. No power struggles, no dominance displays of who's the alpha in the room. Uh, tremendous harmony. Uh, tremendous productivity, best meeting I think I'd ever been in. It just stunned me, actually, having been in a lot of meetings before that in university and business settings. And I walked away thinking, wow, <laughs> I really learned something here. Start by joining. Lay a foundation of community, of the collective. You know, Call the collective into being and then convene the collective, if you will, and then build from there. So you, you see how these things show up in everyday life. So I invite you to reflect on kind of where you're at. Do you feel like there's real comfort and skillfulness with both ends of the spectrum, both poles of joining and separating intimacy and autonomy? Or do you feel, as I have felt over the years, that it would serve you sometimes to actually get better at both of them, to become even more comfortable with entering into the depths of intimate presence, full receptivity, um, wide open being with another person on the one hand. And on the other hand, it would also serve you to get better at, more comfortable with full independence, full autonomy, full self-expression, full self-acceptance of your authenticness out loud into the world. Interestingly, in my experience, and speaking of myself too, a lot of us can get stuck in the middle. We're not comfortable really with depths of vulnerable connection with others, fully with appropriate people, lowering our guard and just being real uh, with, without editing what's really going on inside as appropriate, right? We're not comfortable with that. And on the other hand, we're not that comfortable with uh, cutting loose and being um, really individuated and letting the chips fall where they may without being a jerk about it. We're not comfortable with that though. And so we end up orbiting other people. We don't break away into full autonomous independence, but nor do we really come in for a full landing of joining, We're kind of stuck in the middle. And so it can be really helpful to reflect now, right now, on where you're at with either end here. Interestingly, this is really paradoxical. To get better at intimacy, to become more comfortable with intimacy, it really helps to become more comfortable with and better at autonomy. Because as you get more comfortable and better there, more skillful there is what I mean by better, um, you then become more willing to enter the depths of autonomy, of intimacy rather, because you can, you know you can swim back <laughs> to the other end of the pool and you know you can assert your defenses, your uh, own rights and needs if you need to. That enables greater depths of joining, of intimacy. Flip the other way, as we open into greater intimacy and we internalize it increasingly, we fill ourselves up and we start developing more a sense of being okay and good and worthy and all right, and loved enough as an individual so that we can take that internalized sense with us in the inner backpack, the inner treasure chest, and dare to break loose from the planet and go out there into the world rather than keep, into the universe, rather than keep orbiting that other person. So they, the two serve each other 
you know, and often you'll see this as I kind of move to uh, a close here in relationships with others. So much as I've spoken here uh, with an encouragement to reflect on how this applies to you, you can also think about how might this apply to others in your important relationships. Not framed as, oh, now you're the superstar <laughs> who can pathologize them and you really got their number now. Rick said, and I could see it now in you. No, not doing that. Uh, more as uh, sympathetically, compassionately, and also skillfully starting to realize, oh, that's what's been going on. For example, um, <clears throat> I would have clients in psychotherapy. I want to say now that I'm doing less and less therapy, I'm more and more oriented toward offering, you know, in, in a, at a kind of different scale of reach and uh, not taking on new clients and all the rest of that. So, you, you know, no, you don't need to email me about this. But in any case, um, I would have clients and naively, I was trying to get them to open up. And so I trying to encourage them to join with me more. So I would be really present with them. You know, I'd lean toward them and be really with them. And I noticed they just start backing their chair <laughs> farther and farther. Finally, I realized, whoa, I need to give them some breathing room. I needed to back up myself. Let them intellectualize at some length. You know, let them do various things that were kind of distancing. And maybe comment on it at a certain point with inquiry and curiosity, but often just let it be. And then I finally found them becoming more vulnerable and more revealed with me and getting into more uh, juicy and higher stakes topics. So with other people, sometimes we can break up the script of pursuer and distancer. If we're more the pursuer, to give that other person breathing room. Flip the other way, if you're on the distancing side because you're not that comfortable with joining, if you actually shore up your sense of individual autonomy, then you won't feel like it's at such risk if you lower your guard and step into connection with the other person. Very often, people who appear cold, distancing, um, and rejecting actually have a very insecure sense of their own autonomy and individuation and fundamental all rightness in being who they are. That's an opportunity to shore up. Flip the other way. Often people who are particularly clingy in relationship and enmeshed and kind of panicky about even minor forms of distinction or separation or differentiation, you know, lack of like-mindedness and fusion. People who are like that often don't have a very strongly internalized sense of being loved and being really cared for in a joining kind of way. So shoring that up through repeatedly internalizing authentic experiences of being cared for can be really helpful for that person. It's counterintuitive, isn't it? Kind of paradoxical. But it's really true. So we can have a we can use what I've talked about as I finish here as a way to understand others better, or open up some inquiry even with them as it's appropriate, or find ways without being phony or waiving our own rights by understanding what I'm talking about as it applies to important people in your life. Huh? Sometimes what can come with that is greater skillfulness for you. Little grace notes, little delicacies. You know, you can let a person know, uh, for example, who's vulnerable to loss of intimacy and joining. Hey, I'm really for you. I'm committed to you. I'm loyal to you. The fact that I'm a little irritated right now doesn't mean that our relationship's on the table. And, you know, I sure wish you would X or Y or Z. Like we can say things like that. Flip the other way. If someone is like I've been, kind of prickly around control, uh, growing up in pretty controlling with controlling parents, um, you could start out by saying, look, I'm not trying to boss you around. I totally respect your independence. You decide for yourself what you want to do about this request I'm making. It's a request, not a demand, not a command. 
And, you know, I'd really appreciate it if you would fill in the blank. You know, without walking on eggshells around each other, with some skillfulness and compassion for, you know, <laughs> we're all messed up. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the way of being that the other person has and they acquired for good reason. By taking that into account, we can be more skillful with them. All right. So I'll take a peek at the comments that um, have come in through the chat. I can tell you that while right now live, I can't speed read every single thing. Um, I will always have read your your whatever's come through the chat, whether it's public or to me privately. Um, and I will have received what you have to say, and I, I spend time reading it, you know, after we're formally done here. Okay, so I see that you are really engaging this material. That's fantastic. That's great. So many things I, I you know, won't be able to speak to right here. I'm seeing a lot of engagement. I'm seeing a lot of useful comments for other people. Excellent. Really good. Orbiting is a really useful way of understanding relationships and observing dynamics and looking for uh, interactions or, or behaviors that are combinations of joining and distancing. Like bickering is a com combination joining and distancing. Mm -hmm. Connecting through, uh, you know, intellectualizing can be a form of both connecting and distancing. I mean, sometimes we just talk about ideas with people and it's super fun, we're dancing together, but it can become also a way to keep things at arm's length. Okay, excellent, um, great. Okay, I wanna see what Lynn and Sarah have to say. I'm gonna ask you to unmute Lynn and if you can, please turn on your camera. If you, if you can't or don't want to, it's okay. Great, hi Lynn. Hi, good morning, Rick. Um, thanks so much for um, your very illuminating talk. Right. I have a question. Um, I guess in the in the intimacy realm, um, or you know, in the dating realm, if we are um, being involved with someone who is avoidant or clingy, my question is, how do we bring that awareness first to them without trying to fix? Yep. Uh, you know, especially like I do recognize my tendency to like, oh, I want to help you. I want to fix you. I want to fix yeah. us. Yeah, that's yeah. Good. Well, that's great that you recognize that. Um, and thank you for your question. I always I ask for people to ask specific, clear questions <laughs> that relate to what I've talked about, and you get an A plus. <laughs> good, good job. Um, Sorry. So there's a second part of it, which is how how do you bring that awareness then without feeling hurt? without feeling judgmental if you're involved with them. And I guess the part two would be likewise in the workplace, how would you yeah. deal with a boss with either of uh, that tendency? Thank yeah, you. Yeah, great, oh, super. So lot there, I'll be a little quick to make time for others. Um, the first thing is, you know, it's, it's boringly familiar advice. Uh, first of all, take care of our side of the street. Do what we can to grow and develop ourselves, which gives us more understanding of others. And it also becomes a model for others, including appropriate self-disclosure that can help others understand maybe better what we're asking of them because we're not trying to play superior, we're copying to our own material ourselves. That's a general statement. With other people, um, the thing you said at the very end, I think is really important, is to sort out when to take it personally or not. I think it's often helpful to realize that other people are just doing themselves. And, the, and they're gonna probably keep on being the way they are, you know, without a steep learning curve. And then the question becomes selection. Uh, is the total package good enough given your priorities, values, and time frame? if you're thinking about, you know, looking for a life partner to hang in there with? Um, you know, there's a kind of a classic line about relationships. You know, one person thinks that the other will stay the same. The other person thinks that the first person will change. Often both are disappointed. So you have to be realistic about the change capacity of other people. Uh, 
So there's the question of they're just that way. Then if we have started to, in a deepening relationship, if it's appropriate to talk about how people are in relationship, like in a workplace setting, sometimes it's going to cancel your vote. It's going to affect your career to put that kind of thing on the table, except in an extremely careful, guarded kind of way. On the other hand, sometimes you're more able to talk about that sort of thing in a workplace setting and certainly more able in principle to talk about it in an intimate romantic relationship that's on a path potentially to becoming an important life partner. Um, and if we can't put certain things on the table in an intimate relationship, that is a real yellow flag, if not an orange or red one, about the future of that relationship. Uh, you know, relationships require repair. They require growth and development in people and being able to talk about things is critically important. And if we can't talk about the fact that we're not able to talk about things, that's for me as a serious red flag um, in a significant relationship. So that said, if hypothetically you're with someone and they're, they're distancing, and let's say hypothetically also, you've kind of put it on the table. Uh, little examples and done so skillfully without criticism, normalizing how they are this is very important, not making our way of being the right way. It's so hard not to do that. And it's so important not to do that. Because the truth is what might seem self-evident to us about the way to be, like, I can't believe you're so distancing. Well, I can't believe you're so invasive, right? People are just different. They're like, they have different thermostat settings. You know, they're uh, relatostat. <laughs> some people are cool. <laughs> some people are warm. Uh, for some people, I, I have a friend who would love to hang out with me every day. And uh, me, you know, I my bucket gets full, you know, like a pit stop once a week. You know, that's, that's enough for me. I'm good to go, right? People just vary. So we don't want to pathologize others, but let's suppose you have talked about it. And then the question is, what does the other person do? Let's suppose you've been skillful, you've been reasonable, you've put it on the table, and they battered away. Or they refuse to kind of negotiate with you. Like, for example, let's suppose you'd prefer more closeness. The question is, even if they're natural, I'll do it like this, even if your setting in terms of the intimacy scale going up is toward the high end, and their natural resting state is more toward the low end, is there enough overlap? Aha. Uh -huh. So they can go to the high end of their range. You can go to the low end of your range, but comfortably. And because of other good qualities in the relationship, yeah, we have a fit here. Or are you so far apart that you know there's just no bridging it? So let's suppose you put it on the table and you've talked about it and the other person basically just goes, uh, I don't want to talk about it. Uh, I'm the way I am. Uh, you got to decide if you want to be with me or not. That's personal, right? No wonder we take it personally. And then you have an important decision to make. Flip the other way. Uh, you might yourself, like a certain distancing, you need room to breathe. You don't want to move in. You want your own closet, right? Something, something. Um, and... Uh, you know, the other person just is kind of not giving you the space you need. Again, there too, if they're not willing to budge about that, well, that's a real thing to kind of recognize and figure out what to do. Uh, my own personal experience, just to finish up, is that usually with another person who is there in good faith, who has a general capacity to... They have some emotional intelligence. They can understand themselves. They can step back from their reactions. They can take responsibility for their reactions and be honest about them with you. You know, they can engage you, right? Um, usually, you can find that good enough place because very often the question kind of becomes, how can I help you give me what I need? How can I give you what you need so you can give me what I need? How can I give you the space, the distance, the autonomy you need, you know, the clarity that I'm not trying to dominate you so that you can give me what I need? 
about feeling that I live inside your mind and heart and you're really taking me into account and I matter to you and we're together. Flip the other way. How can I give you what you need around time with me and warmth and interest and empathy for you and genuine listening and participating with you and stuff of various kinds, including maybe with other people? How can I give you that so you're going to be okay with the fact that I just love going for a long hike every Saturday by myself, checked out with my phone off just to be in my own world or other forms of independence, separation, and so forth. If people have that kind of conversation about where can we find an overlap in a real way and are willing to keep their agreements with each other, very often you can find a way, in my experience. Okay. I hope that was helpful, Lynn. And I'm going to move on now to Sarah. I'm going to ask you to unmute. Great. Hi, Sarah. As usual, succinct questions about what I've talked about of general interest. Okay. <laughs> I want to know on this pull scale that you said, avoid intimacy, aut autonomy, where something like narcissism or toxicity like will fall on this scale, yep. things like, or even like mental illness, how it impacts these pulls and how you heal from that. <laughs> Well, um, are you speaking of yourself when you say heal from that or heal from people? Yeah. Who are taught. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. I get it. Um, uh, let's see. Quick detail on our being well podcast. We've actually interviewed some gen, some super experts about it. Rhonda Freeman, uh, wonderful, uh, Romani Durvasala, I believe, um, other people have talked about what do we do when, you know, you're, you've got a partner, you've got a boss, you've got a parent or a parent-in-law, something who is narcissistic, even all the way out to sociopathically or toxically narcissistic, not quote unquote, just immensely self-absorbed. Okay. So a lot of material there. Um, I think it's helpful to recognize it and to try to track, am I dealing with a garden variety person who's just kind of narcissistically needy? because they didn't get those supplies in their childhood of attunement, you know, mirroring, joining, and prizing when they were young. And they're someone who is actually kind of calms down and stabilizes when we give them those kind of supplies today, and they're willing to take them in. So that gradually they fill themselves up and become less dependent on getting their fix externally, you know, of praise, adulation, and so forth. So you're kind of sorting out the difference between someone who, um, you know, can work with this over time and is willing to kind of be real about it in a vulnerable way to someone who, you know, has a narcissistic personality disorder, which is one of the least amenable to change of the personality disorders, you know, that are identified in in psychology. And that person, I just think what's generally necessary is to really bound the relationship, shrink the size of it, uh, not be dependent on them, uh, deal with them as you need to. I think it's helpful actually to have compassion for people who are narcissistic. Um, you know, frankly, they're continually shooting themselves in the foot because they're disrupting getting the praise and appreciation they need because they're jerks about it, uh, you know, and also giving them empathy in a funny kind of way, uh, giving narcissists empathy. I'm using the word narcissist in a globalizing way, forgive me, but expressing empathy and expressing like-mindedness when it's authentic and is not coming off as a manipulation or some, you know, psychological game you're running on them can actually kind of calm down that person. Uh, and as um, finishing here, let's see, was it Maya Angelou who said, when people show you who they are the first time, believe them? You know, I tend to give people three chances. Once, you know, I thought, because I'm kind of mathematically minded, I think one, po a point is a point. Two points define a line. Three points define a plane. And bingo, you know, um, three strikes are out. Maybe two strikes, but one strike, it could be just weird, like what? But I've definitely had people who are high functioning and and got kind of 
triggered around feeling like they were being abandoned or rejected by me and in ways that startled me. It was like we just fell through this exoskeleton of psychological structure, like the eggshell that was seemed solid, but it was actually quite brittle. And when it cracked, wow. It's like the next thing I knew, I was dealing with a, a needy, tantruming three-year-old who was screaming at me for being a bad daddy or the equivalent in a very professional kind of environment. And you suddenly realize, oh, I'm dealing with a high-functioning, vulnerable, borderline person here or narcissistic person here. So if you are rolling along and everything's kind of normal and then suddenly something really weird happens, like they're exiling you in some way or devaluing you. Um, narcissistic people are very vulnerable to feeling devalued. So they counterattack. And suddenly you're like, or you feel like you always have to impress them or prove yourself. Mm, start paying attention to those signals. Okay, that was a whole bunch of stuff, you know. And meanwhile, think about, you know, the first time we're kind of drawn to a charming narcissist, we think it was the charm that got me. The third time we're drawn to a charming narcissist, it's worth asking ourselves, huh, what is it about that person that just kind of gets me? And what can I learn about that? So I'm not drawn to that kind of person the fourth time. Okay. Does the podcast also include mental illness and attachment styles that you were referring to? Yeah, in, in extreme forms. Yeah, those those people are dealing with folks that, you know, in the distribution are like out there in the, you know, on the narcissism scale in the top one to 5%, including extremes. And um, yeah. Great, uh, thank you. I hope that was helpful. Okay, great. I do have time. Maybe I don't have time for two more. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to get to you, Dana. Tony, I've spoken with you, I think, last time. So I'm going to bounce out to Dana. I'm, I'm sorry. Okay, great. Just sorry about that, but keeping it real. Okay, so Dana, asking you to unmute. There you go. This will be relevant to other people. I'm in a situation right now where something happened and it triggered all of my stuff that is, you know, all the unhealthy stuff I got when I was young, which yeah. I know I am no perfect being. Been but, there. Okay. Yeah. This, person, this person I've known 40 years. And um, we have different uh, things that tie us to each other. But one thing happened that hurt me so badly. And I always come off as the emotional one. You know, I'm the wild emotional artist. And this other person is very controlled and, you know, never, I mean, I've never known him 40 years, never seen him cry. You know, he's like, mm. and um, so right now they're away in another country. And, and when they come back, you know, there's going to be a conversation. And what my, what part, what the child in me wants to say is like, hey, you know, I've got it. I don't need to talk about it. I know what happened. I know where you're at. I'm okay. Even though I'm not okay. But um, my fear is to go into why I'm so emotional would be like, I'm so emotional because of all the past, right? But I don't want to say I'm an emotional. I don't want to write. I'm in the now. I can't like say, hey, I'm an emotional because of this thing you did 15 years ago and this other thing you did. You know what I mean? Is that is, is that an understandable question? Like I. Yeah. So much there. And I, I just, you know, I yeah. know I have to talk, but I, I don't know how to do it. Totally. Um, well, the, so this great. I mean, you have a lot of self-awareness, so that's great. And you're raising a broader question which is what do we do with this pile of undelivered communications we have for important people in long relationships? And on any given day, it seems like a bad idea to pop the top on that stack of undelivered communications. And yet as the days become years, you know, we start to wonder about the, you know, life ending on either side and the implications, whatever, you know, we just kind of wonder about that. Um, I've, uh, you know, myself, I don't think there's a right answer or a formula. Obviously, I you know that too. Uh, we go back and forth about whether it's best to just let it be and have a very clear-eyed uh, understanding of how capable other people are to receive communications and repair. And uh, many people are not very capable. And they do stuff when we open up. And, you know, they do stuff. They never talk to us again or they talk 
dirt about us to other people or just can get weird, you know, on, on the one hand. I'm not saying everybody's like that, but I try to keep in mind that we're, we're big monkeys, uh, wild, intense characters. And, you know, I'm amazed that we're doing as well as we are considering, you know, so it's kind of, in, and we can do better when I, mean, I want to do better and I want to help people do better. But so on the one hand, on the other hand, uh, there can be a place where you're just clear that you've decided to communicate for yourself. And that sense of, okay, I'm going to check the boxes of uh, doing this for good purposes. You know, the Buddhist uh, list of uh, the six attributes of wise speech is helpful. The five that are kind of Defining the fifth is desirable but optional. You know, speech is wise if it's well intended, um, actually beneficial, uh, true. We don't say everything, but what we say is true, uh, timely, and without harshness. And then six, ideally wanted. That's a checklist. So let's say you've centered yourself in that, you know, speaking for yourself, and you're just going to share for yourself. And you've decided, you know, what you do with this is out of my hands. I'm not invested in making stuff happen in your black box of the mind. Yeah, I kind of hope for some things, and I'll try to say it in ways that op maximize the odds of you being able to receive it, but fundamentally, I'm speaking for myself, for my own healing, for my own speaking truth to power, standing up for myself, standing by myself, being an ally to myself, um, also, I'm kind of hopeful that this can clear the decks because I value you. And I'm hoping for a deeper relationship, actually, which are sometimes good things to start with if it's actually true. Right? Um, and so then and I'll finish here. Uh, this is a big topic. One thing that's sometimes useful is to draft some letters that you tell yourself initially, I'm not going to send. And even get off your chest some of the early drafts, you know, that might have a certain amount of raw, vicious, angry, you know, spite, whatever, just to get it off your chest, basically. And then you maybe just throw the letter away or cut it into small pieces and burn the pieces, you know, give it up to the, the, the universe, the divine, fine, great. And then you get ready. And then you, once you clarify what you want to say, then you kind of sort through, well, do I really still need to say it to that person? And sometimes when you do this exercise, you, you get complete internally. Uh, or you might decide to share some or all of the letter, or you might find a way to talk with them about it uh, and so forth. Um, maybe I'll, And the last thing I'll just say, if I follow you right, is that when we speak for ourselves in this way, we start disengaging from our preoccupation with what they think, with whether they like it, or approve of us, or whether they think we're an emotional artistic wreck, just whatever. We just, we get out of their head and we get them out of our head. And in the frame that I've been talking about today, we really emphasize the pole of individuation. And we don't, we, we you know, we, our sense of them actually starts to recede. And we're really there for ourselves, that we're, where we have a very full sense of ourselves as we communicate and a more distant, a more, yeah, distanced, um, lighter, um, diffuse sense of them. Yeah. And I'll. I'll... Thank you. It's extremely helpful. It's extremely helpful. Thank you.